So very good evening to everyone. Right? And uh, thank you for having me here. I feel very honored to be amongst very good people to share on this topic called uh, advanced care planning. Now, myself, I'm a Theravadan Buddhist. I was asked to give this uh, rather secular talk about advanced care planning, more along my line of a palliative care doctor. As you know, palliative care, we deal with um, patients who are dying, who is um, critically ill, with parting and separation on a daily basis. Right? And therefore, the majority of palliative physicians do not watch Korean dramas. <laughs> Because every day is a new drama that unfolds, you know. But we watch the drama not so much from the point of um, a, a TV viewer. We put our foot into the muck. We sense that emotions. We feel the pain, you know. But we also learn to take out our foot at the end of the day, take on a reflexive stance, and hope that whatever good that we have imparted, uh, manage to take away part of their suffering, and grow some goodness and wisdom. Uh, in ourselves as well, you know. And I was given this topic on uh, uh, advanced care planning or what we call antecedent decision making because this is something that a lot of our Singaporeans uh, may not be very familiar with and still suffer from the consequences of our ignorance to this topic. So to strike home the point, I'm going to give uh, two stories right, to just illustrate. And of course, these stories will be anonymized. They are a mixture of different patients. And uh, I'm not going to tell you where, in which hospital it happens, but these are real stories. Right? So the first story is a patient who is about 50 to 60 years old. He's a man who is single, right? He was working successfully with a good career, and uh, something happened one day. Something happened in the brain. He probably bled. Uh, he went to the A&E, underwent urgent surgery. Uh, he made it alive. Okay, but he was sustained on a ventilator, which means he was in ICU. He needed machines to maintain his breathing and his blood pressure. And despite whatever that the doctors did for him, whatever that could do you know, in the ICU, he never woke up. He was there for weeks, you know, and uh, different doctors from different specialties saw him and gave a consistent clinical judgment that there is very, very little chance, if at all, that this very unfortunate gentleman will ever have a chance to wake up and meaningfully respond or engage with the family. Right? Now, you can imagine that in such a tragic situation whereby you have a middle-aged man who is having a successful career, who is probably starting to plan about retirement, suddenly collapsing in the middle of a street, brought down to the A&E, an &E, a urgent, uh, very emergency kind of a surgery, and made it alive. But yet... It's tragically, he could never gain back his consciousness to have some form of meaningful conversation ever with his loved ones. He's well-loved by his siblings who visited him daily, you know, who engaged with the doctors and who got very angry when the doctors tried to sit them down and explain the situation that things are bad, there's no way he's going to wake up and that the machines and the tubes and the medicines that's going him it's not going to make him any better. And they broached that subject very sensitively that we may need to withdraw these machines and allow natural death. You know. But in such situations where by death is sudden, it's unexpected, there's a lot and lot of grief, a lot and lot of anger because the person has not spoken his last words. He hasn't prepared his family about what he would have wanted, what unfinished businesses he has. Right? And there's also an uh, envisioning of the future that he has lost. And his siblings, of course, didn't take it very well. They were upset, and as a typical Singaporean, wherever they can complain to, they'll complain to, right? Yeah, they complained to you know, the hospital senior management, it didn't work, you know. They complained to the Ministry of Health, okay, complained to the Prime Minister office, right? Yeah. Uh, the press doesn't work anymore. <laughs> So, of course, the Prime Minister office will then dutifully send an email or a letter asking the hospital to write a report, blah, blah, blah. But, of course, different specialists write the same consistent picture that it's not that we want to give up. It's not that we want to kill this uh, gentleman who is very uh, unfortunate by itself, you know, but that truly there's no medical means to keep him in a meaningful manner and that we have to let natural death occur. You know. The family was deeply religious okay, and wanted a miracle. They prayed very, very hard, and their um, construct, their world construct, 
uh, if you allow any element of doubt to enter your brain, your consciousness, it would then work against the element of miracle. And so the patient was maintained on life support, effectively in a permanently unconscious state for months and months and months. After a while, you know, different doctors came and go, and the family members refused to come in the daytime anymore. They will only appear in midnight hours to avoid the doctors. Because whenever the doctors see them, they will try to engage this family to talk about what would be reasonable to do, but the family doesn't want to come. You know? And finally, one day, the hospital senior management have just to put a firm foot down and said that there's really no way we can continue this. It is, to a certain extent, inhumane to subject a person who is clearly not going to wake up to all these interventions that may be painful and may be uncomfortable and does not serve any benefit. And after a long four hours conversation with the family, uh, we took off the tube and the patient passed away. Right? Did the family then complain to the Prime Minister's office, go to the press? You know, no, they, they didn't. They took it surprisingly well and they went home for the funeral. And we reflected on why and our answer was that they just needed to know that everything that can be done has been done and that they have not left any stone uncovered to make sure that their loved one received the best care ever possible. And you wonder if, let's say, this gentleman, being highly educated, highly functional, uh, knew that one day he might suffer such an unfortunate event, would he have wanted to go through these months of... Um, uh, experience in ICU, whereby you've got tube down your throat, you can't talk, you're fed through a tube in your nose, you know, you've got tubes that you have to change every few weeks in your neck and in your wrist, you've got a catheter inside your private part to drain your urine, you know, and all this goes on until you die. And you wonder whether any respectable person would want to go through that before he finally passes on in ICU. In ICU is not a good place to die in, right? And if he has spoken to the family about it, would the family have taken it a little bit easier? Because in truth, when faced with such a situation, the family faces pressure from all fronts. They don't know what the patient would want. They feel pressured by healthcare staff that they are making a decision to sign on a dotted line for the patient to be, you know, to die. Well, in truth, legally, it is the doctors that will shoulder this responsibility in Singapore's laws. And Singapore's law is unique. When a person loses the ability to make treatment decisions, his primary doctors shoulder the legal responsibility for these life and death decisions. But they must consult the family members before coming to a conclusion. Right? They may also face pressure from other distant family members, and we see this in ICU often, saying that, how can you just give up on your loved one like that? Let's try this alternative medicine. Let's get this faith healer to come. You know, you'll be infilial, unfilial, to just give up on your father or mother like this. Are you doing this because you are tired and you want to give up? Are you doing this because you don't have enough money anymore? So these pressures will come. And the greatest pressure will probably come internally because they struggle too with a loss that's sudden. Right? Now I'm going to share another story, similar nature of a dear friend of mine uh, who also suffered something that happened in the brain, who was cooking in the kitchen, you know, perfectly well, uh, and suddenly collapsed. And he was brought to the A&E, uh, and I was there at the A&E, because I was notified about his, um, his, uh, his collapse at home. In the A&E, I witnessed him being resuscitated. I saw his heart stop three times right in front of me. He was brought back alive, because the modern ways to resuscitate a person can be very good, he ended up in ICU, but also similar situation whereby there's no way that he will be able to regain his consciousness. In fact, he's going towards the line of being what we call brain dead. Right? So in this case, his wife was middle-aged. He's got two daughters. You know, uh, one, of them's going to, one of them is going to give birth to his first grandchild soon. Right? And it would have been a very tragic situation, isn't it? Unexpected, you know an unborn grandchild that never saw the grandfather who doted on the daughters, that was cooking tonic for the daughter who was pregnant. Right. And it would have been a mess. It would have been extremely uh, difficult to swallow for everyone. But a few days later, just a few short days later, 
the wife and the daughters of different religious affiliation decided that it's time to let go. Because although this particular patient did not write down black and white about his wishes, and this is what I'm going to talk about later on, right? his values, his preferences, his beliefs is clearly shared with his family. His family clearly know what kind of person he is, what he values to be important in his life, and they knew deep in his heart that he wouldn't want this to continue if he knew that this is going to happen. And because they knew, they got the right people in, they got uh, his uh, faith community in, in this case a Buddhist community, to chant, to share merits, to help him recount all the good deeds that he has done uh, as a practicing Buddhist. And uh, the, the community gathered around him, the monks came, you know, and on the day that he, he passed on, when we had to withdraw the machine, the monks came to say a prayer, you know, chant with him. The family members spent the last few minutes with him, speaking to him. And after that, we withdrew the ventilator and he passed on smoothly and comfortably. So these two stories, I wanted to strike home a point that in truth, death can happen at any time. Our own minister and our maybe future prime minister also suffered a sudden event. And we may not be so fortunate to have colleagues that are trained uh, doctors that got him back <laughs> to a &E and survived a neurosurgery. Right? You may, or myself, may be one of the unfortunate ones that suddenly collapsed one day. Right? In truth, everyone of us is dying by the minute. Every minute we are walking towards a certain future. But as Asians, we are very taboo to talk about this. We, we were worried that if we were to talk about it, we would die faster. <laughs> In truth, uh, we are dying every minute. <laughs> right? So what we should really do in such situation is to prepare ourselves when we are healthy, when we are alert, we are clear-headed, you know, to tell our loved ones exactly what is important to us. At which point do we feel that aggressive treatment, especially the use of machines and ICU, may not be necessary anymore. Right? It differs from people to people. That there may be 90 years old that tells us 90 years old is enough. Every day I hope I want to go home. Not, not that home, you know, that, that home, okay? Right? Uh, and say every day is, is just an extra day, is a bonus. If I don't get the bonus, I'm fine, you know? There are uh, other people of different ethnic and religious groups who are very devoted and very religious that says that I'll leave my faith with God. You don't need to give me chemotherapy or surgery. I'm fine. At 50, at 60 years old, I don't need that dialysis. I'm fine. But there will also be that 80 years old or 90 years old who needs time. Who needs time to see a son come out from prison. Who needs time to see an unborn grandson to be born. Everyone is different. And therefore, it is important to share your unique needs and unique values with your loved ones on a regular basis because things change. Right? And how do we share this very sensitive and delicate topic? Okay? Usually, we take the opportunity when something has happened at home or something has happened to a friend or family member, and we, you know, there's a jerk to a certain reality that we are actually rather vulnerable. And we then take the opportunity to talk to our loved ones and say, hey, you know, if one day, me too, I end up in a similar situation, this is what I would want, or this is what I would not want. Right? And everyone is different. The more willingly and openly you share, the more your loved one will be able to act on your behalf when the situation strikes. They will be able to extrapolate from your conversation, from your values and beliefs about what they think you would want. And then the doctors will then act in your best interest. So there are three documents that we can do up in order to you know, capture our wishes. Right? These three documents each has its own problem. The first being that of the Advanced Medical Directive. Anyone has done an Advanced Medical Directive? Okay, you can tear it away because it's useless. <laughs> Our transport minister, uh, then health minister, uh, wanted to scrap it and reshape it near a decade ago, but didn't have a chance to. The reason uh, why it is obsolete is because you know, the document basically says that you'll kick into effect only when, no matter what the doctor do, you'll sure die anyway. So the question is, if you sure die anyway, the doctor will also not use the machines anyway. So the document is not helpful. And plus the fact that the document can only be retrieved during office hours. <laughs> So it's hardly being used, right? Okay. Now the second document is called the lasting power of attorney. 
Anyone has it? Right, okay. This one has a bit of use. <laughs> right? Yeah. The lasting power of attorney is created more for people's property assets and a bit of welfare. So your, your donee of the lasting power of the attorney, the one you appoint, would be able to decide simple things like which doctor you go to see, how to use your money in the bank, you know, uh, do you want to sell the property away, do you want to rent it away, the money, how to sustain you, blah, blah, right? But it clearly states in that document, and this is a legal document, that as the donee, he cannot make decisions regarding extraordinarily life-sustaining treatment, which means ICU, or any treatment that the doctor perceives will be related to a serious deterioration in your illness. So any serious thing also, he don't have a decision to authority to do so. But the law also says the doctor must speak to the donee, because this is obviously someone close to you, to ask what this donee think you would want if you knew the situation. So that's the quality, the value of the donee. Right? The third document called the advanced care planning document is perhaps the most useful. It can be started at any point in time, and it is an ongoing conversation. Okay, and you can find some of these um, resources online when you Google advanced care planning, you know, and two various hospitals has it for the public. Kutek Pot and Tan Tok Seng, I know, does it for the public at a reasonable rate. Some GPs do it also, it takes about 30 minutes, relatively cheaply can be done. The main idea for this document to be created is to have you tell your loved one, be it in ill health or while well, still good, to say that if one day I fall critically sick and I cannot no longer express my wishes, I cannot express what I would want, okay, uh, how would I want to be treated? Okay? You may tell, for example, to your loved ones that in the event that the doctors say, I will never be able to wake up again, or if the doctors say, I will not be able to recognize people, talk to you anymore, there's no need to continue this. Or you may say in another way and say that, you know, I, I'm not that ready yet, Okay, if need to, bring me to the hospital. I don't mind some blood taking and some injection antibiotics. If it fails, it's fine. Or you can perhaps tell them that I'm ready. Any time that I need to go back home, please don't stop the cab. Pay the extra fee and let me go. <laughs> so everyone is different. But the, the, the earlier you start this conversation, the more prepared your loved ones are, the less likely they have to suffer that same conflict in the two stories that I've mentioned. Okay, so with that, I'll, my time's up and I'll just end it. We can take questions later on. Thank you.